that'll be great. Yeah. yeah. Easy, easy call.
Fanny. 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 Fanny.
participate in their roles outside of the President's administration prior to joining in. Uh, and we know that, for example, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders and Chief of Staff John Kelly, who you have seen multiple times over these last 24 hours or so in Washington, wanted the President to be able to be uh, more respectful in his response and push the President to, for example, lower those flags, that, that flag above the White House, back down to half staff.
I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth after my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors.
please be seated. Good morning, my name is Randy Hollerith. I am Dean of Washington National Cathedral. On behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and all of us who serve our Lord at this cathedral, welcome. Welcome to this house of prayer for all people. It is an honor to host this service for Senator McCain, to Senator McCain's wife, Cindy, and his mother, Roberta, and the entire McCain family. Our hearts are with you and with all those across our country and around the world who grieve the loss of this great American patriot and statesman. Today, we give John Sidney McCain III back to the God of love who gave him to us. While we mourn his death, our faith tells us that beyond this life, there is indeed more life. And God never lets us go. So as the old prayer says, we gather to give thanks for all the goodness and courage that have passed from John McCain's life into the lives of others and have left the world a richer and better place for his life's task faithfully and honorably discharged for good humor, gracious affection, kindly generosity, for sadness met without surrender and weakness endured without defeat. May the Lord bless him and keep him this day and always. Thank you. The world is a fine place and worth the fighting for, and I hate very much to leave it. When Ernest Hemingway's Robert Jordan, at the close for whom the bell tolls, lies wounded and waiting for his last fight, these are among his final thoughts. My father had every reason to think the world was an awful place. My father had every reason to think the world was not worth fighting for. My father had every reason to think the world was worth leaving. He did not think any of those things. Like the hero of his favorite book, John McCain took the opposite view. You had to have a lot of luck to have had such a good life. I am here before you today saying the words I have never wanted to say, giving the speech I have never wanted to give, <laughs> feeling the loss I have never wanted to feel, my father is gone. John Sidney McCain III was many things. He was a sailor. He was an aviator. He was a husband. He was a warrior. He was a prisoner. He was a hero. He was a congressman. He was a senator. He was a nominee for President of the United States. These are all the titles and the roles of a life that has been well lived. They are not the greatest of his titles, nor the most important of his roles. He was a great man. We gather here to mourn the passing of American greatness, the real thing, not cheap rhetoric from men who will never come near the sacrifice he gave so willingly, nor the opportunistic appropriation of those who live lives of comfort and privilege while he suffered and served. He was a great fire who burned bright. 
In the past few days, my family and I have heard from so many of those Americans who stood in the warmth and light of his fire and found it illuminated what is best about them. We are grateful to them because they are grateful to him. A few have resented that fire for that light it cast upon them, for the truth it revealed about their character. But my father never cared what they thought, and even that small number still have the opportunity as long as they draw breath to live up to the example of John McCain. My father was a great man. He was a great warrior. He was a great American. I admired him for all of these things, but I love him because he was a great father. My father knew what it was like to grow up in the shadow of greatness. He did just as his father had done before him. He was the son of a great admiral who was also the son of a great admiral. And when it came time for the third John City McCain to become a man, he had no choice but in his own eyes to walk in those exact same paths. He had to become a sailor. He had to go to war. He had to have his shot at becoming a great admiral as they also had done. The paths of his father and grandfather led my father directly to the harrowing hell of the Hanoi Hilton. This is the public legend that is John McCain. This is where all the biographies, the campaign literature, and public remembrances say he showed his character, his patriotism, his faith, and his endurance in the worst of possible circumstances. This is where we learned who John McCain truly was. And all of that is very true, except for the last part. Today I want to share with you where I found out who John McCain truly was. It wasn't in the Hanoi Hilton. It wasn't in the cockpit of a fast and lethal fighter jet. It wasn't on the high seas or on the campaign trail. John McCain was in all of those places, but the best of him was somewhere else. The best of John McCain, the greatest of his titles, and the most important of his roles was as a father. Imagine the warrior, the knight of the skies, gently carrying his little girl to bed. Imagine the dashing aviator who took his aircraft hurtling off pitching decks in the South China Seas, kissing the hurt when I fell and skinned my knee. Imagine the distinguished statesman who counseled presidents and the powerful, singing with his little girl in Oak Creek during a rainstorm to singing in the rain. Imagine the senator, the fierce conscience of the nation's best self, taking his 14-year-old daughter out of school because he believed that I would learn more about America at the town halls he held across the country. Imagine the elderly veteran of war and government whose wisdom and courage were sought by the most distinguished men of our time, with his eyes shining with happiness as he gave his blessing for his grown daughter's marriage. You all have to imagine that. I don't have to because I lived it all. I know who he was. I know what defined him. I got to see it every single day of my blessed life. John McCain was not defined by prison, by the Navy, by the Senate, by the Republican Party, or by any single one of the deeds in his absolutely extraordinary life. John McCain was defined by love. Several of you out there in the pews who crossed swords with him or found yourselves on the receiving end of his famous temper or were at a cross purposes to him on nearly anything are right at this moment doing your best to stay stone-faced. Don't. You know full well that if John McCain were in your shoes here today, he'd be using some salty word he learned in the Navy while my mother jabbed him in the arm in embarrassment. He'd look back at her and grumble and maybe stop, stop talking, but he would keep grinning. She was the only one who could do that. On their first date, when he still did not know what sort of woman she was, he recited a Robert Service poem to her called The Cremation of Sam McGee, about an Alaskan prospector who welcomes his cremation as the only way to get warm in the icy north. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. He had learned it in Hanoi. A prisoner in the next cell had wrapped it out in code over and over again during the long years of captivity. 
my father figured that if Cindy Lou Hensley would sit through that and appreciate the dark humor that had seen him through so many years of cruel imprisonment, she just might sit through a lifetime with him as well. And she did. John McCain was defined by love. <laughs> this love of my father for my mother was the most fierce and lasting of them all, Mom. Let me tell you what love meant to John McCain and to me. His love was the love of a father who mentors as much as he comforts. He was endlessly present for us. And though we did not always understand it, he was always teaching. He didn't expect us to be like him. His ambitions for us, unmoored from any worldly achievement, was to be better than him, armed with his wisdom and informed by his experiences, long before we were even old enough to have assembled our own. As a girl, I did not fully appreciate what I most fully appreciate now, how he suffered and how he bore it with a stoic silence that was once the mark of an American man. I came to appreciate it first when he demanded it of me. I was a small girl thrown from a horse and crying from a busted collarbone. My dad picked me up, he took me to the doctor, and he got me all fixed up. Then he immediately took me back home and made me get back on that very same horse. I was furious at him as a child, but how I love him for it now. My father knew pain and suffering with an intimacy and immediacy that most of us are blessed never to have endured. He was shot down, he was crippled, he was beaten, he was starved, he was tortured, and he was humiliated. That pain never left him. The cruelty of his communist captors ensured that he would never raise his arms above his head for the rest of his life. Yet he survived, yet he endured, yet he triumphed. And there was this man who had been through all that with a little girl who simply didn't want to get back on her horse. He could have sat me down and told me all of that and made me feel small because my complaint and my fear was nothing next to his pain and memory. Instead, he made me feel loved. Megan, he said, in his quiet voice that spoke with authority and meant you had best obey. Get back on the horse. It did. And because I was a little girl, I resented it. Now that I am a woman, I look back across that time and see the expression on his face when I climbed back up and rode again. And I see the pride and love in his eyes as he said, nothing is going to break you. For the rest of my life, whenever I fall down, I get back up. Whenever I am hurt, I drive on. Whenever I am brought low, I rise. That is not because I am uniquely virtuous or strong or resilient. It is simply because my father, John McCain, was. When my father got sick, when I asked him what he wanted me to do with this eulogy, he said, show them how tough you are. That is what love meant to John McCain. Love for my father also meant caring for the nation entrusted to him. My father, the true son of his father and grandfather, was born into an enduring sense of the hard-won character of American greatness and was convinced of the need to defend it with ferocity and faith. John McCain was born in a distant and now vanquished outpost of American power and he understood America as a sacred trust. He understood our republic demands responsibilities even before it defends its rights. He knew navigating the line between good and evil was often difficult, but always simple. He grasped that our purpose and our meaning was rooted in a missionary's responsibility stretching back centuries. Just as the first Americans looked upon a new world full of potential for a grand experiment in freedom and self-government, so their descendants have a responsibility to defend the old world from its worst self. The America of John McCain is the America of the revolution. Fighters with no stomach for the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot, making the world anew with the bells of liberty. The America of John McCain is the America of Abraham Lincoln. 
fulfilling the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and suffering greatly to see it through. The America of John McCain is the America of the boys who rushed the colors in every war across three centuries, knowing that in them is the life of the Republic, and particularly those, by their daring, as Ronald Reagan said, gave up their chance at being husbands and fathers and grandfathers, and gave up their chance to be revered old men. The America of John McCain is, yes, the America of Vietnam fighting the fight even in the most forlorn cause, even in the most grim circumstances, even in the most distant and hostile corner of the world, standing even defeat for the life and liberty of other peoples in other lands. The America of John McCain is generous and welcoming and bold. She is resourceful and confident and secure. She meets her responsibilities. She speaks quietly because she is strong, America does not boast because she has no need to. The America of John McCain has no need to be made great again because America was always great. That fervent faith, that proven devotion, that abiding love, that is what drove my father from the fiery skies above the Red River Delta to the brink of the presidency itself. Love defined my father. As a young man, he wondered if he would measure up to his distinguished lineage. I miss him so badly. I want to tell him that he did. But I take small comfort in this. Somewhere in the great beyond, where the warriors go, there are two admirals of the United States meeting their much-loved son. They are telling him he is the greatest among them. Dad, I love you. I always have. All that I am, all that I hope, all that I dream is grounded in what you taught me. You loved me, and you showed me what love must be. An ancient Greek historian wrote that the image of great men is woven into the stuff of other men's lives. Dad, your greatness is woven into my life. It is woven into my mother's life. It is woven into my sister's life. And it is woven into my brother's lives. It is woven into the lit life and liberty of the country you sacrificed so much to defend. Dad, I know you are not perfect. We live in an era where we knock down old American heroes for all their imperfections, when no leader wants to admit to fault or failure. You were an exception, and you gave us an ideal to strive for. Look, I know you can see this gathering here in this cathedral. The nation is here to remember you. Like so many other heroes, you leave us draped in the flag you loved. You defended it, you sacrificed it, you have always honored it. It is good to remember, but we are Americans. We don't put our heroes on pedestals just to remember them. We raise them up because we want to emulate their virtues. This is how we honor them, and this is how we will honor you. My father is gone. My father is gone, and my sorrow is immense. But I know his life, and I know it was great because it was good. And as much as I hate to see him go, I do know how it ended. I know that on the afternoon of August 25th, in front of Oak Creek in Cornville, Arizona, surrounded by the family he loved so much, an old man shook off the scars of battle one last time and arose a new man to pilot one last flight up and up and up, busting clouds left and right, straight on through to the kingdom of heaven. And he slipped the earthly bonds, put out his hand, and touched the face of God. I love you, Dad.
from Requiem by Robert Louis Stevenson. Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave and let me lie. Gladly did I live and gladly die. And I laid me down with the will. Be this the verse you grave for me. Here he lies where he longed to be. Home is the sailor, home from the sea, and the hunter, home from the hill. Cindy McCain and the wonderful McCain family, Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama, Secretaries Kissinger and Clinton, all the other honored guests that are here, ladies and gentlemen. Becoming John McCain's friend is one of the great blessings of my life. Being asked to pay tribute to him today is one of the great honors. And for that, I thank Cindy and the entire McCain family. And I also want to thank them, including his mother, his brother, his sister, the seven wonderful children, for the love and support 
you gave John throughout his life and his service, none more than in the last year of his life. And you, Cindy, have been absolutely, thank you, have been absolutely saintly, and we, his friends, cannot thank you enough. There's a special satisfaction that comes from serving a cause greater than yourself. I heard John say those words hundreds of times, particularly to young people, and you all heard them a lot as well. But for him, we know they were not just words in a speech, they were the creed that he lived by. And the greater cause to which he devoted his life was America. Not so much the country defined by its borders, but the America of our founding values, freedom, human rights, opportunity, democracy, and equal justice under law. In John's life, he nobly served and advanced these American values. And remarkably, his death seems to have reminded the American people <clears throat> that these values are what makes us a great nation. Not the tribal partisanship and personal attack politics that have recently characterized our life. This week's celebration of the life and values and patriotism of this hero, I think have taken our country above all that. In a way, it's the last great gift that John McCain gave America. And I want to suggest today that we can give a last great gift to him, which is to nurture these values and take them forward into the years ahead to make America the better country John always knew it could be. I pray that we will, and I ask you to do so as well. Now let me try to pay tribute to this great man by describing and sharing stories from our friendship, which began in the early 1990s as part of a, a bipartisan group pushing our government to stop the aggression and slaughter in Bosnia. And then we began to collaborate on a lot of bipartisan legislation. But really our friendship deepened in our travels together around the world with our third amigo, Lindsey Graham. When you traveled with John, even with Lindsey along, the purpose was not to have fun. In fact, sometimes it seemed the purpose was just to survive the schedule he had organized. John had a restless energy every day, including the days we traveled, to get the most out of every day he possibly could, and he did. And so did we, who were privileged to know him. John traveled to learn so he could be a better senator. He traveled to represent America as best he could wherever we went, and he did. And he traveled to support the men and women of our armed services, whether in war or at peace, wherever they were. And they, in turn, welcomed him in not just respect, but awe, as the hero John McCain was, is, and always will be. In shared experiences and long conversations, on these trips, John and I got to know and trust each other as friends in a way that doesn't happen because it can't happen much anymore in the frenetic Washington life of senators. Our friendship taught me many things, including, I must add, some jokes that I otherwise never would have known. <laughs> John loved to laugh and make others laugh. When he found a joke that people liked, he told it over and over and over again. <laughs> One of my favorites was about the two inmates going through the food line for dinner at the state penitentiary. One says to the other, the food is terrible here. 
And the other says, it was a lot better when I was governor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard that one often, and I laughed every time because John laughed so hard every time he told it. <laughs> the range of John's mind, interest, and experience was impressive and often surprising. You couldn't characterize this man. He loved to read history and fiction and talk about it, argue about it. He had a pervasive curiosity about just about everything in life. He loved the outdoors in all of God's creatures, large and small, who lived there. Most people would be surprised by how much pleasure this combative senator got from watching the hummingbirds at the McCain family home outside Sedona, Arizona. But of course, John's great uh, strength was his character. He was honest, fair, and civilized. In all the times we were together, I never heard him say a bigoted word about anyone. The American people saw this great quality most clearly during the 2000 campaign when that woman made an offensive statement against then Senator Barack Obama. To me, what was most impressive about John's reaction was that it was pure reflex. It was who John was. He didn't need to consult anyone. He immediately defended his opponent's name and honor and thereby elevated for that moment our politics and, and made us a more perfect union. Personally, I can tell you that John was a real friend in accommodating what to him were my unusual practices as a religiously observant Jew. Whether it was walking with me on a Saturday to an important meeting or turning down a popular Friday night dinner invitation at the Munich Security Conference we went to every year because it was too far to walk, uh, we would stay in the hotel and have what John learned to call our Shalom Shabbat dinners, <laughs> peaceful Sabbath dinners. But of course, with John, they weren't that peaceful. John, uh, naturally, in doing these wonderful uh, acts of friendship, grumbled all the way about what I was putting him through, you know. Right now, uh, I think he's probably deriving some pleasure from the fact that it turned out that his funeral was held on a Saturday and I had a walk to get here. <laughs> I'm sure he, if, if he were right now, he'd tell me that that was divine justice. <laughs> he uh, ultimately, as he did with so much of his life, uh, turned these interfaith experiences into a truly hilarious comedy routine. Uh, it began with a solemn pronouncement by John that he was converting to Judaism. Then he explained much less solemnly, I do this not because of any particular liking for the religion. It's just that for so many years I've had to go along with all of Joe's religious nonsense that I might as well convert and get the benefits. <laughs> One of his favorite targets was the Sabbath elevators in Israeli hotels, which are pre-programmed to stop at every floor. You know, John had many virtues, but patience was not one of them. <laughs> Therefore, rides on those Shabbat elevators were uh, not the happiest times we spent <laughs> together. Um, I, I say this uh, both to say uh, in stories how full and genuine was John's acceptance of my religious practices, which were different, from what he knew, but also to make a larger point, because I can tell you in everything we did together around the world and here in Washington and across America, he showed that same uh, acceptance, respect, curiosity about everybody's religious observances and about everything else about them that was different from himself and his own experiences. I've said that uh, patience was one virtue John didn't have. Forgiveness was a great virtue he did have. 
And here's a story to make that clear. Once on a trip to Hanoi, as we were touring the Hanoi Hilton, a crowd of Vietnamese college students recognized John, and they began to chant wildly, Mac Cain, Mac Cain. They wanted to take his pictures and have him sign autographs. When it was over, I asked him why he got such a rock star reception in Hanoi. And with classic directness, he said, well, first, Joe, it's because they've been taught that I was treated a lot better here than I really was. And second, it's because of the normalization of relations between the US and Vietnam. Well, that was a classic McCain understatement. Along with President Clinton and John Kerry, John McCain was the leader in Congress in bringing about the normalization of relations between the US and Vietnam, an extraordinary act of personal forgiveness when you consider what the Vietnamese did to him during his five and a half years as a prisoner of war. After his injuries in Vietnam, he could not pursue his ambitions in the Navy. So he turned to government service as his greater American cause. Of course, I didn't know John in his youth, but I don't think from what I've heard that he was born with the natural skills of a legislator. And yet he learned them and became a great one. He knew when to be irascible and immovable and when to negotiate and compromise to get something done. He regularly reached across party lines because he knew that was the only way to solve problems and seize opportunities for the people of our country and his state. As a result, his legislative record is extremely impressive. He also fought and lost some big battles to stop climate change, to close the gun show loophole, to broadly reform our immigration laws. But that never seemed to get him down or diminish his ardor for the next battle. He loved to win, but he also loved a good fight for a just cause, even if it didn't succeed. Overall, he won many more than he lost, and all of his big wins were achieved with bipartisan support. In 2008, when John was the Republican nominee for president, he had this far out idea of asking a Democrat to be his running mate. Can you believe that? <laughs> Let me explain it to you, as he did. When he first talked to me about it, I said, you know, John, I'm really honored, but I don't see how you can do it. Even though I won my last election as an independent, I'm still a registered Democrat. And John's response was direct and really uh, ennobling. That's the point, Joe, he said with a certain impatience. You're a Democrat, I'm a Republican. We could give our country the bipartisan leadership it needs for a change. When John returned to the Senate after his surgery last summer and voted against the Republican health care bill, some people accused him of being disloyal to his party and the president. But that was not the case. If you listen to the speech he gave that day, you'll know it was not the case. It, that speech made clear that his vote was not really against that bill, but against the mindless partisanship that has taken control of both of our political parties and our government and produce totally one-sided responses to complicated national problems like health care. And of course he was right. In his remarks last July, John also spoke eloquently of our position in the world, of America's continuing responsibility for principled leadership in the world. It was as if he thought that might be one of his last best opportunities to move his colleagues and his country. It's a speech worth reading, but I just want to quote one sentence. What greater cause could we hope to serve than helping keep America the strong, aspiring, inspirational beacon of liberty and dignity and defender of the dignity of all human beings? That in short, 
was the McCain American foreign policy, moral, engaged, and strong. And again, these words were not just rhetoric for John. He acted on them. He lived them. In our travels around the world, I can tell you, he always reassured our allies and unsettled our enemies, standing for America's best values, attacking totalitarian governments, whether in Moscow, Tehran, Pyongyang, or anywhere else. If we were going to a country that was not fully free, John insisted that we meet with the local human rights activists as well as the government. I will never forget that day in Myanmar during the military dictatorship there. We met three men who had just been released from political prison and showed terrible signs of physical and psychological abuse. And yet they told us that they would never have survived if they had not heard in jail that the great American senator, John McCain, had supported their cause, read their names on the U.S. Senate floor, and demanded their release. On another occasion, we visited a refugee camp for Syrians who had been forced out of their country into Turkey by the brutal aggression of Assad, the Iranians, and the Russians. We were the first members of Congress to visit that camp, and there was some concern about the reception we would receive. Earlier in the day, in fact, an official of the UN had been there and was booed and had shoes thrown at him. When we arrived, a large crowd of Syrian refugees had formed and was, in fact, chanting. But rather than booing and throwing shoes, they were cheering and cheering, cheering and chanting words of welcome and thanks. And the two words they chanted most were John McCain. What is most remarkable about these two stories, and I could tell you many more, is how unremarkable they are. And that's because the name John McCain, based on the actions of the man John McCain, had become a source of hope and inspiration for oppressed people throughout the world, as it was a source of security for allied countries that share our values. One last story. One of John's favorite cities in the world was Jerusalem. And one of his favorite things to do there was to stand on the balcony with Lindsay and me of our hotel, looking out at the old city and discussing all the religious and political history that had happened there over the centuries. So when I first told John that I had decided not to run for the Senate again in 2012, he was puzzled and frankly, even a little bit angry. But then the next day he called me and this is my best recollection of the conversation. He said, you know, I've been thinking, if you go out into the private sector, you're gonna make some more money. And then you and Hadassah can afford to buy a second home in Jerusalem that has an extra room for me <laughs> with a balcony where we can look out and talk about that city and its history. Well, since then, when I talked to John or visited with him, he would ask me, Joey, have you made enough money yet to buy that place in Jerusalem? <laughs> and I'd answer, not yet, Johnny, but I'm getting closer. Now, uh, sadly, fate has intervened before we could realize that dream. But I am comforted by the fact that Jerusalem is not just a holy and historic city. It is also the visionary symbol of the dreams that all people share and the destiny that we all desire. It is the original heavenly 
shining city on the hill. In, in that sense, for many people in the life of the Spirit, Jerusalem, the shining city on the hill, are really heaven. And it is to that heavenly Jerusalem where I am confident the soul of John Sidney McCain III is going now. And I want to imagine that there's going to be a beautiful home waiting for him there with a balcony from which he can contemplate the shining city and hopefully inspire us here on earth to conduct ourselves with just some of the patriotism, principles, and courage that characterize his magnificent life of service to America and to so many noble causes greater than himself. Godspeed, dear friend. May angels sing you to your eternal home. Our country has had the good fortune that at times of national trial, a few great personalities have emerged to remind us of our essential unity and inspire us to fulfill our sustaining values. John McCain was one of those gifts of destiny. I met John for the first time in April 1973 at a White House reception for prisoners returned from captivity in Vietnam. He had been much on my mind during the negotiations to end the Vietnam War, partly also because his father, then Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Command, when briefing the President, answered references to his son by saying only, I pray for him. In the McCain family, national service was its own reward. They did not allow for special treatment. I thought of that when his Vietnamese captives, during the final phase of negotiations, offered to release John so that he could return with me on the official plane that had brought me to Hanoi. Against all my instincts, 
I thanked them for their offer, but refused it. I wondered what John would say when we finally met. His greeting was both self-effacing and moving. Thank you for saving my honor. He did not tell me then or ever that he had had an opportunity to be freed years earlier, but had refused a decision for which he had to endure additional periods of isolation and hardship. Nor did he ever speak of his captivity again during the near half century of close friendship. John's focus was on creating a better future. As a senator, he supported the restoration of relations with Vietnam, helped bring it about on a bipartisan basis in the Clinton administration, and became one of the advocates of reconciliation with his erstwhile enemy. Anna was John's lodestar. It is an intangible quality. It is not obligatory. It has no written code. It reflects an inward compulsion, free of self-interest. It fulfills a cause, not a personal ambition. It rep represents what a society lives for beyond the necessities of the moment. Law makes life possible, honor ennobles it. For John, it was a way of life. John returned to an America divided over its presidency, divided over the war, amidst all the turmoil and civic unrest, divided over the best way to protect our country and over whether it should be respected for its power or its ideals. John came back from the war and declared that this is a false choice. America owed it to itself to embrace both strengths and ideals. In decades of congressional service, Ultimately, as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, John was an indefatigable exponent of an America strong enough to vindicate its purpose. But John believed also in a compassionate America governed by guided by core principles for which American foreign policy must always stand. With liberty and justice for all is not an empty sentiment, he argued. It is the foundation of our national consciousness. To John, American verities had universal applicability. I do not believe, he said, 
that there is an Arab exception any more than there is a black exception or an Asian or Latin exception. He warned against the temptation of withdrawal from the world. We will not thrive in a world, he warned, where our leadership and ideals are absent. We would not deserve it. In this manner, John McCain's name became synonymous with an America that reached out to oblige the powerful to be lawful and give hope to the oppressed. John were never academic maxims. He was in the front lines of all these battles for decency and freedom. He was an engaged warrior fighting for his causes with ebullience, with courage, and with humility to the limit of the feasible, and sometimes miraculously, even beyond it. John was all about hope. In a commencement speech at Ohio Wesleyan University, John summed up the essence of his engagement of a lifetime. No one of us, if they have character, leaves behind a wasted life. Like, like most people of my age, I feel a longing for what is lost and cannot be restored. But if the happy pursuits and casual beauty of youth prove ephemeral, something better can endure. And endure until our last moment on earth, and that is the honor we earn and the love we give at a moment in our lives when we sacrifice for something greater than ourselves. Heroes inspire us by the matter-of-factness of their sacrifice and the elevation of their vision. The world will be lonelier without John McCain. His ebullience, his faith in America, and his instinctive sense of moral duty. None of us will ever forget how even in his parting, John has bestowed on us a much needed moment of unity and a renewed faith in the possibilities of America. Henceforth, the country's honor is ours to sustain.
Uh, Cindy and the McCain family, I am honored to be with you to offer my sympathies and to celebrate a great life. The nation joins your extraordinary family in grief and gratitude for John McCain. Some lives are so vivid, it's difficult to imagine them ended. Some voices are so vibrant and distinctive, it's hard to think of them stilled. A man who seldom rested is laid to rest, and his absence is tangible, like the silence after a mighty roar. The thing about John's life was the amazing sweep of it, from a tiny prison cell in Vietnam to the floor of the United States Senate, from troublemaking plebe to presidential candidate. Wherever John passed throughout the world, people immediately knew there was a leader in their midst. In one epic life was written the courage and greatness of our country. For John and me, there was a personal journey, our hard-fought political history. Back in the day, he could frustrate me. And I know he'd say the same thing about me. But he also made me better. In recent years, we sometimes talk of that intense period like football players remembering a big game. In the process, rivalry melted away. In the end, I got to enjoy one of life's great gifts, the friendship of John McCain. And I'll miss him. Moments before my last debate ever, with Senator John Kerry in Phoenix, I was trying to gather uh, some thoughts in the holding room. I felt a presence, opened my eyes, and six inches from my face was McCain, who yelled, relax, relax. <laughs> John was, above all, a man with a code. He lived by a set of public virtues that brought strength and purpose to his life and to his country. He was courageous, with a courage that frightened his captors and inspired his countrymen. He was honest, no matter whom it offended. Presidents were not spared. <laughs> he was honorable, always recognizing that his opponents were still patriots and human beings. He loved freedom with the passion of a man who knew its absence. He respected the dignity inherent in every life, a dignity that does not stop at borders and cannot be erased by dictators. Perhaps above all, John detested the abuse of power, could not abide bigots and swaggering despots. There was something deep inside him that made him stand up for the little guy to speak for forgotten people in forgotten places. One friend from his Naval Academy days recalls how John, while a lowly plebe, reacted to seeing an upperclassman verbally abuse a steward. Against all tradition, he told the jerk to pick on someone his own size. It was a familiar refrain during six decades of service. Where does such strength and conviction come from? perhaps from a family where honor was in the atmosphere, or from the firsthand experience of cruelty, which left physical reminders that lasted his whole life, or from some deep well of moral principle. Whatever the cause, it was this combination of courage and decency that defined John's calling, and so closely paralleled the calling of his country. It's this combination of courage and decency that makes the American military something new in history, an unrivaled power for good. It's this combination of courage and decency that set America on a journey into the world to liberate death camps, to stand guard against extremism, and to work for the true peace that comes only with freedom. John felt these commitments in his bones. It is a tribute to his moral compass 
that dissidents and prisoners in so many places from Russia to North Korea to China knew that he was on their side. And I think their respect meant more to him than any medals and honors life could bring. The passion for fairness and justice extended to our own military. When a private was poorly equipped or a seaman was overworked in terrible conditions, John enjoyed nothing more than dressing down an admiral or a general. He remained the troublesome plebe to the end. Those in political power were not exempt. At various points throughout his long career, John confronted policies and practices that he believed were unworthy of his country. To the face of those in authority, John McCain would insist, we are better than this. America is better than this. John, as he was the first to tell you, was not a perfect man, but he dedicated his life to national ideals that are as perfect as men and women have yet conceived. He was motivated by a vision of America carried ever forward, every up, ever upward, on the strength of its principles. He saw our country not only as a physical place or power, but as the carrier of enduring human aspirations, as an advocate for the oppressed, as a defender of the peace, as a promise, unwavering, undimmed, unequal. The strength of a democracy is renewed by reaffirming the principles on which it was founded. And America somehow has always found leaders who were up to that task, particularly at the time of greatest need. John was born to meet that kind of challenge, to defend and demonstrate the defining ideals of our nation. If we're ever tempted to forget who we are, to grow weary of our cause, John's voice will always come as a whisper over our shoulder. We are better than this. America is better than this. John was a restless soul. He really didn't glory in success or wallow in failure because he was always on to the next thing. Friends said he can't stay in the same experience. One of his books ended with the words, and I moved on. John has moved on. He would probably not want us to dwell on it, but we are better for his presence among us. The world is smaller for his departure and we will remember him as he was, unwavering, undimmed, unequal. To John's beloved family, Mrs. McCain, to Cindy and the McCain children, President Mrs. Bush, President Secretary Clinton, Vice President and Mrs. Biden, Vice President Ms. Cheney, Vice President Gore, and as John would say, my friends, we come to celebrate an extraordinary man, a warrior, a statesman, a patriot, who embodied so much that is best in America. President Bush and I are among the fortunate few who competed against John at the highest levels of politics. He made us better presidents just as he made the Senate better, just as he made this country better. 
So for someone like John to ask you, while he's still alive, to stand and speak of him when he's gone is a precious and singular honor. Now, when John called me with that request earlier this year, I'll admit sadness and also a certain surprise. But after our conversation ended, I realized how well it captured some of John's essential qualities. To start with, John liked being unpredictable, even a little contrarian. He had no interest in conforming to some prepackaged version of what a senator should be, and he didn't want a memorial that was going to be prepackaged either. It also showed John's disdain for self pity. He had been to hell and back, and yet somehow never lost his energy or his optimism or his zest for life. So cancer did not scare him, and he would maintain that buoyant spirit to the very end, too stubborn to sit still, opinionated as ever, fiercely devoted to his friends and, most of all, to his family. It showed his irreverence, his sense of humor, a little bit of a mischievous streak, after all, what better way to get a last laugh than to make George and I say nice things about him to a national audience? <laughs> and most of all, it showed a largeness of spirit, an ability to see past differences in search of common ground. And in fact, on the surface, John and I could not have been more different. We're of different generations. I came from a broken home and never knew my father. John was the scion of one of America's most distinguished military families. I have a reputation for keeping cool. John, not so much. We were standard bearers of different American political traditions, and throughout my presidency, John never hesitated to tell me when he thought I was screwing up, which by his calculation was about once a day. <laughs> but for all our differences, for all the times we sparred, I never tried to hide, and I think John came to understand the long-standing admiration that I had for him. By his own account, John was a rebellious young man. In his case, that's understandable. What faster way to distinguish yourself when you're the son and grandson of admirals than to mutiny? Eventually, though, he concluded that the only way to really make his mark on the world is to commit to something bigger than yourself. And for John, that meant answering the highest of callings, serving his country in a time of war. Others this week and this morning have spoken to the depths of his torment and the depths of his courage there in the cells of Hanoi when day after day, Year after year, that youthful iron was tempered into steel. And it brings to mind something that Hemingway wrote in the book that Megan referred to, his favorite book. Today is only one day in all the days that will ever be. But what will happen in all the other days that ever come can depend on what you do today. In captivity, John learned in ways that few of us ever will 
the meaning of those words. How each moment, each day, each choice is a test. And John McCain passed that test again and again and again. And that's why when John spoke of virtues like service and duty, it didn't ring hollow. They weren't just words to him. It was a truth that he had lived and for which he was prepared to die. And it forced even the most cynical to consider what were we doing for our country? What might we risk everything for? You know, much has been said this week about what a maverick John was. Now, in fact, John was a pretty conservative guy. Trust me, I was on the receiving end of some of those votes. But he did understand that some principles transcend politics, that some values transcend party. He considered it part of his duty to uphold those principles and uphold those values. John cared about the institutions of self-government, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, rule of law, separation of powers, even the arcane rules and procedures of the Senate. He knew that in a nation as big and boisterous and diverse as ours, those institutions, those rules, those norms are what bind us together. They give shape and order to our common life. Even when we disagree, especially when we disagree. John believed in honest argument and hearing other views. He understood that if we get in the habit of bending the truth to suit political expediency or party orthodoxy, our democracy will not work. That's why he was willing to buck his own party at times, occasionally work across the aisle on campaign finance reform and immigration reform. That's why he championed a free and independent press as vital to our democratic debate. And the fact that it earned him some good coverage didn't hurt either. John understood, as JFK understood, as Ronald Reagan understood, that part of what makes our country great is that our membership is based not on our bloodline, not on what we look like, what our last names are. It's not based on where our parents or grandparents came from, or how recently they arrived, but on adherence to a common creed, that all of us are created equal, endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. It's been mentioned today and we've seen footage this week of John pushing back against supporters who challenged my patriotism during the 2008 campaign. I was grateful, but I wasn't surprised. As Joe Lieberman said, it was John's instinct. I never saw John treat anyone differently because of their race or religion or gender. And I'm certain that in those moments that have been referred to during the campaign, he saw himself as defending America's character, not just mine. For he considered it the imperative of every citizen who loves this country to treat all people fairly. And finally, while John and I disagreed on all kinds of foreign policy issues, 
We stood together on America's role as the one indispensable nation, believing that with great power and great blessings comes great responsibility. That burden is borne most heavily by our men and women in uniform, service members like Doug, and Jimmy, and Jack, who followed their father's footsteps, as well as the families who serve alongside our troops. But John understood that our security and our influence was won not just by our military might, not just by our wealth, not just by our ability to bend others to our will, but from our capacity to inspire others with our adherence to a set of universal values, like rule of law and human rights, and an insistence on the God-given dignity of every human being. And of course, John was the first to tell us that he was not perfect. Like all of us who go into public service, he did have an ego. Like all of us, there were no doubt some votes he cast, some compromises he struck, some decisions he made that he wished he could have back. It's no secret, it's been mentioned, that he had a temper. And when it flared up, it was a force of nature, a wonder to behold. His jaw grinding, his face reddening, his eyes boring a hole right through you. Not that I ever experienced it firsthand, mind you. <laughs> but to know John was to know that as quick as his passions might flare, he was just as quick to forgive and ask for forgiveness. He knew more than most his own flaws and his blind spots. And he knew how to laugh at himself. And that self-awareness made him all the more compelling. You know, we didn't advertise it, but every so often over the course of my presidency, John would come over to the White House, and we'd just sit and talk in the Oval Office, just the two of us. And we'd talk about policy, and we'd talk about family, and we'd talk about the state of our politics. And our disagreements didn't go away during these private conversations. Those were real, and they were often deep. But we enjoyed the time we shared away from the bright lights. And we laughed with each other. And we learned from each other. And we never doubted the other man's sincerity or the other man's patriotism or that when all was said and done, we were on the same team. We never doubted we were on the same team. For all of our differences, we shared a fidelity to the ideals for which generations of Americans have marched and fought and sacrificed and given their lives. We considered our political battles a privilege, an opportunity to serve as stewards of those ideals here at home and to do our best to advance them around the world. We saw this country as a place where anything is possible. And citizenship is an obligation to ensure it forever remains that way. And more than once during his career, John drew comparisons to Teddy Roosevelt. And I'm sure it's been noted that Roosevelt's man in the arena oration seems tailored to John. Most of you know it. Roosevelt speaks of those who strive, who dare to do great things, who sometimes win and sometimes 
come up short, but always relish a good fight. A contrast to those cold, timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Isn't that the spirit we celebrate this week? That striving to be better, to do better, to be worthy of the great inheritance that our founders bestowed. So much of our politics, our public life, our public discourse can seem small and mean and petty, trafficking and bombast and insult and phony controversies and manufactured outrage. It's a politics that pretends to be brave and tough, but in fact is born of fear. John called on us to be bigger than that. He called on us to be better than that. Today is only one day in all the days that will ever be. But what will happen in all the other days that will ever come can depend on what you do today. What better way to honor John McCain's life of service than, as best we can, follow his example? To prove that the willingness to get in the arena and fight for this country is not reserved for the few, it is open to all of us. That in fact, it's demanded of all of us as citizens of this great republic. That's perhaps how we honor him best by recognizing that there are some things bigger than party or ambition or money or fame or power, that there are some things that are worth risking everything for, principles that are eternal, truths that are abiding. At his best, John showed us what that means. For that, we are all deeply in his debt. May God bless John McCain. May God bless this country he served so well.
us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother John. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with John's family and friends in their grief. Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and their going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he who watches over his elect. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 15, verses 12 through 13. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The word of the Lord. Let us remember John McCain with the words of the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. What I do is me, for that I came. But I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. Don't misunderstand me. I am not recommending John for sainthood. He was so very human. And for that reason, we can see God in his life. He was the just man, justicing. For John McCain, Every human being deserved to be treated justly. He saw God our Father through the features of every person, especially the poor and those persecuted by power and those in need. John was a man who loved, and he knew that love is seen in actions, in doing. He was so often surrounded by the service men and women he had such a special affection for. We can hear him in Shakespeare's words. But we, we shall be remembered. We, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Love is truly shown in action, and God, in his love, has given us this warrior as a sign who acted in God's eye what in God's eye he was. Though we are sad, we do celebrate the life of our friend, husband, father, senator, and warrior, by, because he did keep grace, Christ playing in 10,000 places. He gave us an example of how to live, how to be the just man. And with St. Paul, John can now say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Goodbye, John McCain.
calling from glen to glen and down the mountain side. As Jesus taught us, so we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For our brother John, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for John and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raise the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for John and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May his soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.
Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. Where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest to Christ, your servant, Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant John. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own flock, a lamb of your own fold, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen. And may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. In the days you have and in the lives to which you have been called, working as he works in you what is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.
me when you want us to come down. Yeah, call us when you want me to come down. I'll, I'll go to work. Oh. Okay, good.
Clyde, what's your name? Your name's down there? Do something for you. Hey, what you doing here? 